So then these access here too. This one, this gate is wider than that one. Okay. I'm just going to set my papers down back there and then I'm going to help the crew set up. Um, stay, um, and I forgot to tell you guys, you can meet, I was doing some repotting of plants. So I put stuff all over the table, but let me just move that over. rain garden right here because our main concern with this rain garden is protecting the water the runoff from this rooftop right here so what we're going to be doing eventually is catching this downspout burying it and conducting the water from the rooftop to our rain garden but the complication that we ran into is the area where we were going to put the rain garden is marked up with electrical and communication lines and those lines can actually be anywhere within two feet of the paint markings. So right here we have pretty much a four to six foot stretch of area that's just a no dig zone. There's no way that we can be digging up to two feet, which is what we need for the depth of the rain garden. So what we had to do is change the location slightly, which ends up being okay for our purposes because we're actually shifting it to a spot in the yard that's even lower than where we were gonna dig originally. Um, and thankfully we brought enough um, piping that we can still bury that downspout and conduct all of the water from there down here and we'll have a nice little gradual incline helping us along with that process. And where's the new one? So the rain garden has now moved to this, this big nice oval here. So there's a lot of paint going on at the moment, um, but this is the line that we're following is this oval. It's roughly 7 to 8 feet wide and about 11 to 12 feet long. I noticed several years ago when property ownership changed behind me and a lot of trees were removed that my runoff got worse. So that now I have a lot of standing water and um, the runoff from the house just is not able to absor be absorbed in the ground. So I started looking out and went to the home show and started talking with people out there about how best to approach this. I was then um, connected with uh, Louisa Black from Southern Nursery and we started talking about what could be done. Um, she drew, drew up some proposals for me and it was quite expensive. I then happened to see an article in the Virginia Beacon and saw about the um, VCAP program. And that's when I contacted the, their office and started to get some information to help with financing this project. Um, so what we're doing right now is we're taking out the bulk of the depth of the excavation. Um, and the reason that we're doing that is because we want those outer edges to slope gently inward. So we wanna make sure we're not um, rushing the slopes. So first we're gonna dig out two feet in the middle and then we're gonna work our way gently backwards. After we finish the excavation and loading that up onto the trailers, then we're gonna come back in with the rain garden mix and fill the same hole that we just dug back on up 
but we're not going to fill it all the way up to grade. We're actually going to leave what's called a ponding depth of about four to six inches, depending on the requirements of the site, so that if that rain garden does fill up all the way, we'll have a little bit of area at the top where the water can comfortably sit in that depression without overflowing out. The VCAP program, VCAP stands for Virginia Conservation Assistance Program. It's funded through the Department of Conservation and Recreation and uh, was really a, a response to seeing a need to develop an urban and suburban cost share program for conservation practices that would mirror many of the programs that have been in place for a number of years for rural areas and agricultural projects. And uh, this program was originally only funded for the Chesapeake Bay watershed and, and in the past year or two has been expanded to encompass all of Virginia's watersheds. Um, this project is located on the Sclafani property in what we call the southern watershed area in Virginia Beach, which ultimately drains to the Albemarle Pamlico Sound in North Carolina. And uh, the program is a reimbursement program for funding, and uh, applicants whose projects are approved for, for funding are reimbursed following completion of their project based on a formula uh, developed by the state and it addresses about 12 different kinds of best management practices, rain gardens being one. So you can see the depression starts right about at this line, and this is the very back border of the rain garden. So at the back, we have the tallest plantings, and these are our only evergreens as well. So these reedy looking plants right over here are called soft rush. They'll stay evergreen, and um, they'll have a cloudy seed head, which will actually provide wildlife and nesting material for native birds. In front of that, the next layer that we have is a mixture of irises, so we have iris virginica here, or blue flag iris, and then all the way up towards the front we have another wave of iris, those are called dwarf crested irises. So they'll bloom slightly different colors and at slightly different times, but, so that's just going to help us extend the pollinator season from the very beginning of the spring all the way to the end of the fall. The next little wave of plants that we have are these little mist flowers right here. So these are actually in the mint family. So as you might know about mints already, they're quite aggressive and they'll fill in really quickly. You'll see them growing a lot of the time on wet roadsides, ditches, that kind of thing. A lot of the plants that we're using here are really hardy, semi-aggressive plants because we want them to be really be able to handle a wide range of conditions from periods where they're relatively dry to periods where they're completely inundated for maybe a couple days at a time. Down here, these nice purple flowers that are currently in bloom right now, which is the middle of October. This is called gentian, um, and it's actually called closed bottle gentian because it has an interesting pollinator ecology where the bumblebee actually has to squeeze into the clasped petals in order to access the nectar. 
So I chose these both because they're complementing the purple colors elsewhere in the planting and also because they bloom quite late in the year. So again, we're trying to think about how can we start that pollinator season as early as possible and extend it as late as possible. That's what the mist flowers are doing as well. Um, next, we have another wave of little irises, although they're not commonly known as irises. Their common name is blue-eyed grass, but they're in the iris family, and they also bloom very early on in the spring. So again, we're thinking about how can we start as early as possible and end as late as possible. Finally, these tall leaves that have been eaten back by the caterpillars, these are called seashore mallow. So they bloom in the middle of the summer to the late summer. They bloom this beautiful sort of hibiscus looking light pink flower. And those are going to get quite tall. They're one of the tallest plants in our planting besides the irises and the soft rush. Um, I think that might cover it for our plants in here. Do we have any other information we wanted to cover about them? Uh, what kind of maintenance over the years? How, how do they fill in? Um, that's a great question. So, especially with conservation landscaping, we're starting off with general patterns, but we're not going to control each plant and restrict it to the place where it was originally put in. So a lot of these plants might migrate to parts of the planting where they'll naturally do better in ways that we can't necessarily predict from the outset. So different designers have different philosophies of maintenance. My philosophy is generally to listen to what the plants are telling you they want to do and collaborate with them in order to aid them in their goal of where they're trying to get to, where they're doing the happiest. So for example, over time we might see that this mist flower seeds into the middle of the planting and fills in the empty spaces. Or maybe the irises decide they like it more to the left of the planting more, or more to the right of the planting. So what we're not going to do when we're doing our maintenance schedule is restrict the plants to where we had originally planted them. We're going to listen to where they want to go and the only real weeding and maintenance that we're going to do is keeping back any plants that introduce themselves that we know won't do well in the rain garden in the long term or that could be invasive and crowd out the plants that we do want in there.